Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the True Life Podcast. We are here with the one and only Dr. Rick Strassman. He's a psychiatrist, a professor, an author, documentary filmmaker, pioneering researcher in the world of psychedelics, holds degrees from Stanford University and Albert Einstein College of Medicine, a gentleman and a scholar, Dr. Rick Strassman. Thank you for spending some time with me today. Well, my pleasure. What an exciting time we live in today. And I was hoping we could take a little tour through some of the monumentous books that you've written, maybe starting with uh, the, the one you've made a documentary out of, DMT, The Spirit Molecule. Well, uh, it's, it's a behind-the-scenes um, account of that DMT study, uh, why I did it, uh, what the study um, looked like, uh, how I got approval uh, from the government to do the first new study in psychedelics and humans in 20 years. Um, you know, the experiment, what we found, uh, a large part of the appeal of the book are the stories, the accounts of the trips of the DMT volunteers. Those take up about a third of the book. And then uh, I speculate a bit about potential roles of DMT, which is the drug we studied and uh, talk about the dark side a bit, you know, the adverse effects, which are not uh, all that rare when you give a big dose of a psychedelic. And then uh, kind of thoughts about future research. Uh, and so that book summarized the work we did between 90 and 95, which is actually a long time ago now. Uh, and uh, I finished the research in 95 then spent a couple of years writing the book, it came out in early 2001. And uh, as you mentioned, it was turned into an independent documentary that I helped produce as co-producer called DMT, The Spirit Molecule as well. And for a while, it was the most streamed independent documentary about drugs on Netflix at a particular you know, point in time there. Uh, but there are some marketing distributing questions and it's not on Netflix, but you can watch it for free on YouTube. It has a lot of interviews with the volunteers. It's a fascinating book to read and the documentary, I haven't seen it, but in my mind, I've got the documentary in my mind from reading the accounts of them. I'm curious, what was it like to see or hear the accounts of those individuals who were in the study when they come back and they seem so much like prophecy and you're hearing these accounts for the first time? What, where, where was your faith then? Were you big into the, the Hebrew Bible then? Or how did you integrate those accounts? Well, it was a very strange time. Uh, you, you know, you give somebody a huge dose of DMT and they're just lying there. You have no idea what's going on. You, you're keeping an eye on their blood pressure and their heart rate. Um, if they need anything, a hand or a blanket or to be moved around a little. Uh, but other than that, other than watching their blood pressure and heart rate, you've got no idea what's happening. Uh, yeah, you know, so I would ask people how it went when they would first open their eyes and lift up their eye shades. Yeah, and I really didn't know what to expect. Most people found it to be uh, incredibly intriguing. Um, it's kind of an almost immediate entry into a world of light, which is possessed of intelligence and power. And it, that intelligence and power sometimes coalesces into recognizable objects. Uh, we, call, we ended up calling them beings rather than aliens or entities. You know, beings seemed to cut to the chase, and you know, they existed. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was very strange. I was giving DMT sometimes seven days a week. Um, and... Uh, we were just out there. It was Albuquerque, New Mexico, University of New Mexico. You know, nobody knew what we were doing. Even people at, at UNM. Uh, there was me, there was a nurse. Uh, there was a lot of curiosity from the rest of the nurses. So they wouldn't wonder what was going on back there. Uh, yeah, the director of the research unit, I overheard him once explaining w uh, what the study was back there. And he said, they're smoking mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> So I figured I was keeping really well off the radar uh, with what we were doing. Yeah, and I wrapped up before really it uh, you know, caught on. Uh, and it's been gratifying that 
you know, that work is being recognized and utilized again. Um, yeah, I, I didn't know what to make of the accounts. I was expecting the white light, you know, Kensho, Satori, Enlightenment, uh, you know, the mystical unitive state. There is no self, uh, no personality, no time or place. You just merge with the source of all being. Um, I was expecting that kind of experience, as were most of the volunteers, because most of them were practicing some sort of meditation. And I was coming at it from a several decade long relationship with the Zen community, studying and practicing under their supervision. And so, you know, that was the kind of experience I was hoping and the volunteers were expecting too. Yeah, you know, but it was completely different. It was just these things interacting with the volunteers whose personalities were maintained, uh, even more so perhaps. Yeah, and there's communication. So um, I finished the studies, started looking for another model uh, for the psychedelic state other than the white light mystical state. Yeah, and by and by I stumbled upon the Hebrew Bible and the prophetic experience. Uh, and that's uh, the work involved or uh, discussed, you know, the findings, the ideas um, in the second book, or the third book, actually, it's called DMT and the Soul of Prophecy. In between those two was a book called Inner Paths to Outer Space, which is a uh, you know, collected works. There were four of us. Uh, and we're talking about the other experience in the psychedelic, especially DMT state, the you know, sense of the other. You know, what is it? Um, how do you understand it? Uh, you know, how do you relate to it? Yeah, and then I kind of took a deep dive into the Hebrew Bible and the prophetic state. Uh, and uh, that's the, you know, the basis of DMT and the soul of prophecy. Then I got sick, really sick, incredibly sick, almost died twice. Ooh. And the care I got in this little town was just unbelievably bad. And uh, I, I was keeping notes because I thought if I lived through it, it would be a, a really great story. Um, and so I lived through it, and that was the basis of an autobiographical novel, Joseph Levy Escapes Death, uh, that came out in 2019. And just a, and uh, yeah, it, it's it's a dark comedy, um, you know, medical kind of sick twisted humor, but still, you know, it gets laughs. And uh, you know, that was my intent. Um, and uh, so this book came out just last month, The Psychedelic Handbook. And uh, it's a little textbook of psychedelic drugs, um, what they are, where they're from, how they work, uh, what the major drugs are. The um, largest chapter is called How to Trip. Uh, so it provides a lot of common sense uh, suggestions about how to make the most of your psychedelic drug experience. Um, I talk about adverse effects, you know, what to do, you know, how to recognize them, uh, what kind of helps available. Um, yeah, the lob, the microdosing about which is all that much isn't known scientifically, although it you know, seems to work. Uh, and uh, yeah. It's a small book is under the text itself is 184 pages. Uh, and you know, then there's the footnotes and the references. Uh, and so it's quite uh, compact. Uh, the feedback has been good. I was on Joe Rogan on the same day the book was released. And so that got a lot of interest. Uh, and uh, yeah, sales have been good. The reviews have been good. So I'm encouraged. I'm hoping it'll be the, the textbook for anybody interested. Uh, you know, college students, grad students, uh, your medical students, psychiatrists. Uh, it's a pretty bare bones, common sense, you know, level headed approach to psychedelics. They're good. They're bad. You know, it just depends how they're used. Uh, and, uh, you know, you should educate yourself uh, before you give them or before you take them. Yeah, I got, I, I picked up a copy. And I think right now, if people go to your site, you're actually signing copies for people. Is that yes, correct? Yes, I will. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, if they order through rickstrossman.com, um, yeah, I will inscribe and sign their copy. It's amazing. I, I think it's an incredibly practical guide for all, not even not all, it's not all of them. It's for psilocybin, LSD, ketamine, MDMA, DMT, ayahuasca. And what I liked in there too, was there's a lot of background. One thing that I really liked in the meat of the book was the way you talked about not only medieval metaphysics, but the Buddhist Abhidharma. And you also incorporate that in the soul of philosophy, how you created the hallucinogenic scale in, in the prophecies. Can you talk a little bit about that particular Abhidharma Buddhist philosophy and how that influenced you? Uh, yeah, it emerged through my longstanding interest in Buddhism. Um, in college, I learned about Buddhism. I you know, took a class and uh, learned transcendental meditation. And then uh, during a leave of absence from medical school, I ended up at a Zen Buddhist monastery. And I started uh, affiliation with them in 70, 74. Yeah, and I went back to medical school. And uh, there was an opportunity to uh, you take electives at a certain point in your schooling, I'm at medical school. And I got an elective to study with a Tibetan Buddhist Lama who was uh, you know, teaching mental health professionals the foundation of, uh, well, what was it actually called? Well, it was intended for mental health professionals. And it was his attempt to introduce Tibetan psychology, you know, Tibetan you know, Buddhist psychology, and the way in which it's empirically based on m specific types of meditation practice. Uh, and so they've developed these practices that cause certain effects, and those effects are laid down in their psychology. Uh, you know, this is what happens when you do this meditation. This is what happens when you do that meditation. So it was very um, phenomenological. It, was you know, just the facts. Uh, if you do this, th uh, then this will happen. So in the process of taking that class, uh, he introduced us to the Abhidharma, uh, which is the school of Buddhist psychology. And, uh, you know, it's a huge mm -hmm. discipline, volumes upon volumes. Uh, but one of their principles uh, is the notion that ongoing experience is possible is you can you can break down ongoing experience into what are called skandhas or heaps uh, you know five different uh mental functions uh for example emotion and thinking and bodily sensation volition uh, those kinds of things so when i was wondering about how to develop a questionnaire that could sub uh quantifiably measure subjective experience, uh, you know, giving a number to, you know, visions. Uh, so uh, about the intensity. Um, yeah, you know, so I developed that questionnaire after interviewing 20 people that had been smoking DMT even beforehand. This was like a long time ago, but I just wanted to get a you know, sense of what the experience was going to be like uh, before starting the research. And from those interviews, I started putting together a questionnaire that was skanda based. Uh, you know, what were the visual effects and what were the physical effects and what were the emotional effects? So um, it worked out great, actually. Uh, the first version was pretty lengthy. We cut it down and uh, it was quite doable. Yeah, and uh, it gave what's called dose response data uh, scores increased the more drug you gave uh, so we divided the question well it was about 100 questions uh, you know 20 for this 20 for that 20 for this um, and we analyzed the responses you know, for all 100 items and the, the skanda approach to clumping items together was better than one derived from the computer itself, you know, from the statistics, uh, or just as good, but no worse. And we ended up using the Abhidharma uh, you know, system because it 
you know, held up better against the facts too, the descriptions of people's experiences in addition to its statistical power. Uh, so that questionnaire is still in use. It's called the HRS, the Hallucinogen Rating Scale. I haven't touched it for almost 30 years. It's getting really rusty. <laughs> and if you know, there's any graduate students out there listening, uh, you know, give me a holler and uh, you know, I could you know, set you out to do a good project on you know, tuning up the HRS, modernizing it. That's almost a book in itself, the way you can find a way to quantify subjectivity. <laughs> it's pretty amazing to think of. And on top of that, like, isn't it interesting that you integrate this Eastern idea into the Western so that you can integrate the, the accounts of these people on DMT? I, I thought it was also interesting how you introduced relatedness to look at the prophecy side of it. Well, the hallmark of like the mystical unitive state is there's no relationship. It's all one. Y you are it, it is you. Um, yeah, there's no difference. There's no subjectivity or objectivity. Um, but in the DMT state, it's just the complete opposite. You're in constant contact with this world out there or in, in here. There's interaction. You know, there's relatedness. And um, when I was comparing the DMT effect, kind of you know based on the you know, Buddhist scale of perceptual, emotional, so on, the phenomenology of the DMT state compared to the prophetic state, uh, you know, they were like completely identical, you know, phenomenologically. You know, the visions, the voices, the emotions, the somatic effects. But the one thing that was more highly articulated in the prophetic state uh, was the relatedness. Uh, it was very well expanded upon, unpacked. Uh, all kinds of relationships uh, occurred between someone in a prophetic state of consciousness and the content of that state, you know, be it angels, be it God, be it words, dreams. Uh, so you know, that's... Uh, where the two states differed. Uh, you know, people could describe their interactions with the contents of the DMT world, but not that clearly. Uh, it was kind of muddled. Communication was kind of muddled. It was not, re it was kind of haphazard relating uh, with the state. Um, and there wasn't the, you know, there weren't the tools, the language. Um, as opposed to the Bible, when somebody's in a prophetic state and communicating with God or angels, you know, there's all kinds of interactions. There's questions and answers and advice and admonitions and you know, directions and inspiration. Yeah, you know, so it's, you know, it was a striking difference between the two. Um, one point maybe to make is when I talk about the prophetic state, uh, it's simply an altered state of consciousness, which occurs in any character in the Hebrew Bible. And so it could be a dream, it could be courage, it could be the ability to preach or to sing or to teach. Um, it isn't necessarily foretelling or predicting. Uh, you know that might occur in an altered state and a prophetic figure, but you know not always, and it's hard to know what to make of those predictions. Um, yeah, you know, so relatedness was what, in a way, allowed me to make you know the transition from studying you know, the DMT state to the biblical experience, you know, the biblical narrative, you know, the you know, Bible's version of existence. Yeah, I thought it was there was so many similarities when you began talking about Moses, and then you would cut to an account of one of the volunteers who had a similar experience. One question I've always wanted to ask you, though, is it seems to me that translation equals interpretation. And so when you're studying the Hebrew Bible, how, how do you know that some of those things they were like, how do you get past that barrier of translation and interpretation? Um, you need to learn the original language. Right. Yeah. Um, and um, fortunately, as a kid, I went to Hebrew school between the ages of five and 13. And I learned some conversational Hebrew. Um, I was a good student, went to camp, you know, summer camp on a scholarship when I was 
12 or something. Uh, and I was you know, pretty good at conversational Hebrew for a while anyway, and then stopped speaking it maybe when I was 13. You know, so once I kind of twigged to what was happening in the Hebrew Bible, I thought I'd start studying it again. And yeah, as you say, all translation is interpretation. And so if you really want to know what the text is trying to say, you need to know the original language. So I uh, went back to the drawing board, got a bunch of dictionaries, and uh, just slogged through it. it. Took me, gosh, 13 years or something from beginning to end. Um, so understanding the language uh, is one step. Uh, the other is to find good commentators, uh, the interpreters of the text, because it's very hard to understand. I would say impossible uh, without interpretation and a common uh, a commentary. Um, you know, so the ones I've relied upon primarily are the medievalists. Uh, they wrote between, I don't know, 700 AD and 1600 or so, if you count Spinoza. Uh, otherwise, about 1400 maybe. Uh, the, uh, you know, that tradition ended. Uh, so those are the commentators. Uh, they'll take you by the hand and explain every verse every word. If there's any question, they'll just say, you're, you're wondering about this. Well, there are a number of ways to interpret it. There's A, B, and C, and D. Uh, the, you know, the basis of the interpreters or the, um, the priority of the interpreters that I like the most are the ones who attempt to explain the face meaning of the, of, of the words. So if it says, you know, so-and-so walked down the road, it means so-and-so walked down the road, as opposed to the soul is seeking its home in the everlasting perpetuate, uh, you know, perpetuity. It was, it's you know, simply what the text is trying to say, uh, as opposed to an allegorical interpretation. Yeah, so those are the commentators that I like. Uh, the, you know, the one I like the most is Abraham Ibn Ezra. Uh, he was a Spaniard, quite a character. Um, let me show you a Please. book of his that I'm reading for the second time, which is a very rare thing. Yeah, it's called The Secret of the Torah. Uh -huh. And it's by Abraham Ibn Ezra. Okay just came out a year or two ago. The translator is Strickman, S-T-R-I-C-K-M-A-N, Strickman. Yeah, and uh, you know, this is the way I interpret the text, uh, Secret of the Torah. Uh, yeah, it's, it isn't that long, maybe 150 pages or so. Yeah, uh, it's a common sense approach uh, that is dependent on understanding Hebrew and Hebrew grammar. If you have common sense and can understand Hebrew and Hebrew grammar, then that's all you need to understand the Hebrew Bible. It's a radical point of view. You know, the Kabbalists you know, just hate it. <laughs> you know, because if you can interpret text by yourself, that makes yeah. them dispensable. <laughs> Even the clergy, uh, but you know the Kabbalists in particular. You know the Kabbalists interpret things, you know, quite allegorically. Um, you know, nothing is as it seems, and that's true. But you know, there's a time and place for that. I don't think studying the text is in, is necessarily most beneficial if it's interpreted as trying to say something else. I think you have to really start with what it's. Uh, you know what it's actually saying. Yeah, so Ibn Ezra. I like it. Yeah, that, we're back to interpretation. If you're the Kabbalist and you can interpret things, it gives you a lot of authority over situations that may or may not be beneficial to you. It, it, one part I really, the reason I ask it is, this was the first time I had heard the idea of behold, the dream. And in the, in the biblical standard, you hear this word behold. And that's, this is the first time after reading your book that I realized that that's a stopping point. Behold, and then here is the vision, at least in some cases, it seems like. Yeah, yeah. Um, all kinds of things you can discover by 
you know, looking very carefully. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the thing behold, the word behold, hine, hine, behold. Yeah, it usually introduces uh, a prophetic experience, a dream, a vision. Yeah, uh, you can um, establish all kinds of patterns in what the text is trying to say. It, you know, there are certain, you know, bywords or you know, catchwords that indicate that what's coming up is important or what just was discussed was important, or, you know, this is uh, the case, you know, this is the case all the time, or this is the case just, you know, some of the time. Yeah, you, you know, so if you're one of these, you know, guys who lived a thousand years ago and just studied the Torah all day long, uh, you discover. Yeah, yeah, it's, there's, there's so much out there. I, Another distinction that I saw you make was the difference between thought process and thought content. I thought that was pretty fascinating. Thought processes is like speed, for example, <laughs> you know, thinking speed yeah. um, or slow uh, or slow thinking or confused or, you know, muddled or sharp and creative. Um, yeah. You know, so that's, you know, th uh, the uh, you know, process of thinking, uh, the you know, content of thought, uh, is you know what's in there? Like, are you thinking about home? Are you thinking about dinner? Um, are you thinking about mathematics? Yep. And then, are you the first time I've ever heard this this word too, or this kind of process was tardema, the process of kind of we spoke about how God speaks to Abraham as the sun is about to set, or it, it almost reminds me of Marseille Iliad's like, you know, the terror before the sacred, but just this. Can you explain to people what Tardema is? Tardema, yeah. Um, well, nobody has asked me during a podcast to explain <laughs> Tardema. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's you know, pretty deep in the woods, but but still, I think it's a variety of the prophetic state. It's a it's a you know, flavor of a prophecy, and you know the reason that I'm all you know, hung up on the prophetic state is because it provides a moral and an ethical scaffolding to experience very highly altered states in which you communicate with angels and with God. And the DMT state, you communicate with angels, maybe with God. There's, there's a, lot, a lot of communication. Um, and I think the, the most you know, highly developed um, religious tradition uh, articulating an interactive relational spirituality is Hebrew Bible prophecy. You know, so I think you could interpret uh, the psychedelic state and apply the psychedelic state through the lens of what you learn by reading the Hebrew Bible. You know, the, the nature of prayer, the nature of repentance, the nature of a vow, all those things I think play a role in more attentively interacting with this world, just doing a better job. Um, I, think a I think a lot of psychedelic experience isn't really utilized because um, it's had and then forgotten, or it might be impactful, but there's no specific thing they learned and communicated. Uh, so a verbal tradition can be quite helpful in that regard. Um, yeah, yeah, so Tarde Ma was what happened to Abraham. Uh, he, uh, that was a long story with Abraham, uh, you know, but you know, there is about to be a, a covenant made between Abraham and God. And um, Abraham enters into this very deep, thick, altered state. You know, Tardema really means dumbfounded, just completely inert. Um, yeah. So uh, that's one of the forms of prophecy. You know, that's what you know, people look like in the state that they enter into. Yeah, you know, but it's of interest that, you know, that experience was the first promise of the covenant with Abraham. Um, and Abraham was the first of the Jews. So it was a very significant you know, prophetic experience. And... You know, as I'm thinking about it, I don't think there are other cases of Tardema in the text. There could be, you know, but it isn't 
you know, it isn't commonly described. Yeah. It makes me, it, it makes me curious about this impact because in your book, you say that that is one of the main differences is that even though the DMT and potentially other psychedelics open the doorway to these kind of experiences. They lack the morality and the theology of it. I was wondering if you could unpack that for people a little bit. Well, I think that you get more out of a psychedelic experience if you know what you're looking for. um, And if you're able to ask the right questions of that state and to understand what the answers are and to be able to remember them um, and express them in a way that's most helpful both for you and outside of you. So uh, that's where education comes in. Yeah. You, you would you know, train yourself or, well, you know, somebody asked me once about, you know, how do you, you know, have a more spiritual psychedelic experience? And so I said, well, just live a more spiritual life. <laughs> and you know, then your psychedelic experience will be taking place in the context of a spiritual life. You know, so uh, if you want to articulate the psychedelic information that you've witnessed or apprehended or perceived, um, yeah, it requires understanding. It, well, it, 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 it requires understanding what you're about to see and also uh, you know, benefits you know, from having some tools, you know, to learning how to interact with the spiritual world. Yeah. So besides, like, well, uh, there's quite a few different names for God in the Hebrew Bible, and each of them represents a particular attribute of God. And so there's you know, maybe six which are most common. You know, so if you're in a psychedelic state and you think you're interacting with God it would be handy to know that there were six aspects to God and which one are you dealing with? And if it's one particular one, you know, then you're familiar with the nature or, yeah, you know, with the nature of that uh, perspective on God, that characteristic of God. Um, you know, so you have knowledge, uh, which will uh, help you go deeper because if it's one aspect of God, for example, you can ask that aspect of God for help or ask a question uh, in an area that is most apropos. If you're interacting, for example, with an aspect of compassion and of mercy, you would then ask for healing. But if you were interacting with an aspect um, you know, that was mostly characterized by strength, you would ask for courage. You know, so, you know, those are things which would be helpful, you know, to know in advance. I'm, and uh, if you have a text and a tr- uh, if you have a text and you have a tradition, uh, and kind of a, the unpacking of it by the commentators, you're that much further ahead in knowing what you're going to do and what you're looking for, uh, you know, why you're doing it. Uh, you've got some tools at your disposal. Yeah, that's that's really well said. I. You know, there's something to be said about knowing the environment in which you're going to operate and asking the right questions. And, you know, there, there's such a rich library of people who have made us somewhat of a spiritual journey. If people are willing to go to the library, if people are willing to do the work, then you can enrich your life in a way that is beyond measure. You know, and I, I really think if people spent more time in the library or processing what the spiritual relationship can be like, then they would have a more fulfilling spiritual relationship yeah especially if you study the text you know, i think you know, you know that the text is the closest thing we have to god other right. than nature you know, there's you know nature which yeah. is a demonstration of you know god's existence and there's text uh which is you know the verbal representation so um studying nature and studying the text yeah if more people read more i think we'd be we'd be a lot better off. It can lead us in, I'm into Aristotle, mm-hmm. uh, which I you know, focus on in the Prophetic States book. And I, I also, uh, you know, I also take on a detour um, into Aristotle in the current book, uh, right. you know, the Psychedelic Handbook. 
Okay. Well, so Aristotle divided um, on the mind into the imaginative faculty and the rational faculty. Uh, the imaginative uh, you know, faculty is aesthetic. Uh, it's perceptions and it's emotions and it's uh, you know, bodily sensations, um, you know, meaningfulness. You know, that occurs within the imaginative part of the mind. And uh, the rational part of the mind contains everything else. It contains ideas, notions, abstract concepts. So I think with, I think if you want to get the most out of a psychedelic experience, or it may be better yet to say, if you only want it to be an aesthetic experience, uh, you know, then uh, it occurs in the imagination. If you want to make it both a intellectual, verbal uh, you know, source of information, well, as well as an aesthetic experience, um, you study, you have the vocabulary, you go to the library. This brings up someone else you quote in the same book, the, high, the psychedelic handbook is Maimonides, where he talks about the merging of intellect and imagination, which you say is the highest realm of spirituality. That's a pretty important idea to think about. Yeah, yeah. Maimonides was a Jewish philosopher and uh, you know, physician um, who lived in Egypt in the 1200s. Interestingly, I think that Maimonides lived at the same time that Dogen lived. You know, Dogen is the you know, founder of uh, you know, Zen in Japan, uh, and you know, Dogen went to China to study because the you know, Japanese Buddhism wasn't to his liking, and then he studied in China and then came back to Japan, started Zen there. Uh, so Dogen is like a huge you know, character um, in Zen Buddhism, and uh, Maimonides and you know, Dogen you seem to be living at the same time. You know, Maimonides was, I mean, even though he was born in Spain, um, ended up living most of his life in Egypt. So Maimonides, you know, was an Aristotelian, and he divided you know the mind into the imagination and the intellect, and uh, in his constructing a model you know, for prophecy using you know the science of Aristotle, you know the psychology of Aristotle, uh, Maimonides suggested it is the end result of perfecting the imagination and of you know, perfecting the intellect. Uh, and you can perfect the intellect through study, but you know, back then there weren't a lot of um, you know means to stimulate the intel uh, to stimulate the imagination. You know, the imagination was you know, felt to be you know, more material and resided in the brain. Uh, and if you were uh, you know, born with a good brain, good. If you were uh, you know, born with one that that wasn't so healthy, uh, your imaginative capacity isn't as great. Or if you damage your imagination slash your brain through you know, dissipated living, you know, so the most you could do uh, with your imagination, you know, was to not damage it. You know, but with, uh, you know, but I think it's uh, worth you know, considering that you know, psychedelics stimulate the imagination primarily. There, uh, you know, visions and there's voices and there's emotions and whatnot. You know, but the intellect, not so much. So it uh, it's, it you know, seems as if we have got at our disposal, you know, now uh, a way to stimulate the, uh, the a way to stimulate the imagination with with you know great reliability. Yeah, I often wonder. It seems to me that on higher doses of psilocybin, language fails. Like we, we don't have the capacity to thoroughly explain what it is we're seeing or we're feeling, or we just lose, we, language fails there. But I think that's an opportunity to create new ideas. I think that those are connected somehow. What do you think? Yeah, I think that uh, explaining anything verbally is impossible. <laughs> You know, so it's, you know, the ideas that you develop. Uh, yeah, so it, it you know, could be in a big you know, psychedelic state that there are no words you know, for it, but you can describe it. 
uh, you, you can say it, it, it was without words, it was white, it was intense, uh, there was no sound. Uh, you can describe it. Um, and if enough you know, people describe it, you know, there'll be a consensus. Yeah, it's, it's, it's blurry on the edges, you know, but it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. And I, I think it's a state in which you can learn a lot about yourself and the world around you, because you don't have the right words, it forces you to see the world differently. Um, you think so? I, I, I do. I think that, I think that it, it forces you to think deeply about something that you might regularly just use a frivolous word for, and it maybe makes the situation deeper. Well, what do you think that is? What do I think the deeper situation is? Yeah. I think it's a better understanding of self. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's a way to either understand or experience yourself. Well, I think one of the things which occurs in a really big psychedelic experience is you do need to let go. Right. Yeah. And you know, the letting go can be a novel experience. Uh, and you do learn a lot. Uh, you know, I don't think I would be able to relax anywhere, you know, nearly as well as I can now if it weren't for my experiences with the, you know, psychedelics. You know, like if you've got pain, you just let it go and you lose. Yeah, it's much more intense and uh, requires a lot more uh, adopting a you know, passive state uh, willfully. Uh, so, you know, letting go, you know, that's where people have a hard time when they trip is they can't let go and you fight it uh, and uh, it just gets worse. It's like, you know, being in a wrestling match with somebody who's 500 pounds, mm -hmm. uh, there's just no way. Uh, it just gets worse the more you resist. So um, it's a very you know, handy tool to have. You can develop it through meditation and through yoga, prayer, those kinds of things. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's one of the points I make in the you know, How to Trip chapter uh, in the new book, Letting Go. I think you also make that point in Joseph Levy Escapes Death. You know, you talk quite a bit about... <laughs> I just want to first start off. The book is awesome. For those who haven't read it, the book is called Joseph Levy Escapes Death. And it is somewhat autobiographical, I would say. And for me, Dr. Strassman, I was at the dentist the day I got the book working on the crown. <laughs> that's, a, that's a bad omen. You can imagine, Mike. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> But I, I really, I, I don't want to spoil too much of in the end or whatever, but I really liked the book and it did make me mad. I got mad at Joseph Levy sometimes, but then there was times I laughed out loud, which to me is the mark of a good book. And I, what, how did that, how did you go from this deep DMT research and studying the Hebrew Bible? And then all of a sudden, like, I'm going to move my way into fiction. Well, it was kind of you know, forced upon me. Um, you know, I completed the Prophetic States book in 2014. Oh, you know, one little anecdote. Yeah. Uh, you know, the translator of this book, you know, okay. the Ibn Ezra book, is a uh, rabbi named Strickman. And I was visiting him. You know, we, we bonded over Ibn Ezra. And I was in Queens uh, from New Mexico and, you know, went to visit him and his, uh, and his wife. And I described what... You know, I, I described you know, what I was working on, a you know, biology of you know, prophecy. And she said, be careful, watch yourself. Yeah, so I ought to have you know, taken her advice you know, because I finished the book <laughs> and I got really sick. Um, I had a bad tooth. It swelled. I was on steroids. I flew someplace, really not thinking, uh, to California and picked up a bug because the steroids I was on for my tooth, I had no immunity. Yeah, and then um, ended up in the hospital, not treated that great, and then developed a super bug, this unbelievable diarrhea. Mm. Uh, I lost a lot of weight. It was a close call too. Nobody really knew what to do about it here. Uh, so um, it was... Uh, 
you know, the prediction or not the prediction, you know, the advice not well taken from the rabbi's wife to <laughs> you know, be more careful. Um, you know, so everything which occurred to the protagonist occurred to me and everything that went through his mind went through my mind. It's pretty dark. He's, you know, like the character is pretty pissed off and he's got a good reason to be pissed off. People are really being mean to him. And so, uh, yeah, you know, but like uh, people used to ask you know, Philip Roth if he's Alexander Portnoy and he said, I'm not Alexander Portnoy. <laughs> you know, so it's a caricature. You're only... Uh, you know, selecting certain things from the full experience that are consistent with the, you know, the personality of that character. Yeah. I think, I think you could do a series. I think you could have, you know, in my, in my mind, I was waiting for him to wake up from a acid trip or wake up in the New Mexico hospital from his DMT trip or something like that, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's just impossible. It's hard to believe. So Graham Hancock is a friend and, uh, yeah, Graham wrote a review or a, like a blurb on the back of the book, and he said this this is a really strange character, <laughs> and he couldn't really wait to you know find out what was going to happen next. Yeah, so yeah, I I, I really liked it. I, I and then and then from there you move into this new handbook, which is it's it's a very practical guide, and I think it gets to the crux. It gives a good view of each individual psychedelic in the mainstream if someone was new to it they could pick it up and be like okay here's here's like a something i can follow if somebody has seen their way through it not only is it a good review but it's packed full of other information that you may not know yeah i th yeah well uh thanks very much yeah yeah i'm pretty happy uh with the way the book turned out it's quite short i mean it's amazing i could pack so much in there um you know, the you know, subtitle uh, refers to psilocybin, LSD, ketamine, MDMA, and DMT ayahuasca. Yeah, but I also include 5-methoxy DMT, which is the toad. And I include ibogaine, which is an African plant, or it's a compound in an African plant, which seems to be quite helpful for addictions. And salvia, uh, you know, salvia divinorum, which is kind of a weird, obscure, exotic, you know, psychedelic. Um, you know, but we couldn't include all those on, right. on the front cover. Uh, yeah, um, just the most popular ones. Um, yeah, it uh, you know seems as if there's a lot of interest in uh, you know, psychedelics now. Uh, I think especially after Michael Pollan's book came out, uh, there's just a lot of interest academically, the media, business, uh, you know, pharma, yeah. uh, everybody. Um, and uh, it's a little starry-eyed, uh, at least you know, to my tastes. <laughs> um, and I also feel some responsibility to you know, keep the movement uh, within some boundaries. Uh, you know, because if it weren't for my study, I mean, none of this would be happening. Or if it were happening, we wouldn't be at this point. It would be five, 10 years before, or uh, you know, five or 10 years ahead. Um, you know, like our work, began it and uh i feel some responsibility to you know kind of give my opinion uh you know what i think is going right what i think could use some work uh so uh, it's a bit more you know level-headed uh it's written by you know somebody that's done the research i'm a clinician i've given psychedelics i've taken them i've you know, been in the field a long time i understand how they work as you know close to as well as anyone um, so um, I uh, I just wanted to kind of you know, bring things a bit yeah you know back to earth. Yeah, I think you did a good job at putting in like risk factors and you know here he, it's not all sunshine and rainbows. Like there's real possibilities of finding yourself in dangerous situations, and I think you make that clear in the book. Yeah, you can find yourself in you know, dangerous situations. You could also be just feeling terrible. You could just be paranoid and depressed and anxious and suicidal and confused. Um, yeah, I, I think as you know, more people take more uh, you know, psychedelics, there's a, I don't think it can be any other you know, way than you know, more adverse effects are reported uh, in you know, the medical psychiatric literature in the field retreat centers. Um, you know, I think 
you know, I was uh, thinking about this the other day. You know, within you know my study, you know, fifty-three volunteers. You know, there were you know five maybe who didn't do that well. Um, a couple got depressed. You know, they responded to either therapy or getting back on medication. You know, quite quickly. Um, you know, one guy's you know, blood pressure went sky high. It was uh, close to dangerous. You know, somebody developed panic attacks. You know, somebody had a horrible, horrible trip, just terrifying. Um, you know, so it's around ten percent in our study, and you know, these were normal volunteers, and we really screened them carefully. And even with them being normal t volunteers, you know, with uh, you know previous experience, you know, taking psychedelics, it was still you know ten percent or so. You know, so if you know ten percent in our study. I think the adverse effects are not being reported all that accurately in the research world and you know the pharma world. Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, it I mean, it could be ten percent, uh, and I think it you know may be even greater with you know the lax regulations involved in you know, some of these movements to decriminalize and legalize. Yeah, you know, as someone who has pioneered the re first, first off, let me just say thank you. For for the people on the forums like Shroomery or Long Shroomery or Longevity or the people that are out on the networks or Erowid, there's a lot of people that probably wish they were here talking to you and they would want me to say thank you for them as well as myself. So thank you for what you've done with your research and and for those people as well. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> I'm glad to be of help. <laughs> yeah. Do you see that? Do you see? Because you've done it for so long and you began the pioneering process, do you see a potential possibility for a clampdown like happened in the previous wave? I do think that's possible. Um, you know, there are certain things I hope we will have, uh, I hope we learned from the 60s uh, with, you know, the end of research and the clamping down on the field. Uh, you know, one is, you know, to avoid Pied Pipers. Um, like, you know, somebody like, you know, Tim Leary standing in front of a hundred thousand screaming stoned hippies saying, you know, tear down the system. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, you know, that's a bad idea. <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, that won't occur this time around. It's quite tempting. Uh, you know, there are people, it seems to me, who are struggling to not, you know, be Pied Pipers. Uh, but I think, you know, they're, uh, I, I think that they are, you know, um, you, you know that they know what you know, kind of problems that could lead to. Um, I think the you know the researchers ought uh, uh, well you know both the researchers and you know the pharmaceutical you know commercial communities you know, shouldn't overpromise. I think that can't help but be the case. But still, uh, you know they should know that they're overpromising and uh, you know, be prepared you know for the backlash. You know, minimize the overpromising. I, I guess, um, you know, to be transparent about adverse effects. I think that's going to be important uh, because there are going to be them, uh, and uh, you know, that's uh, important to be straightforward. Um, and you know, keep in mind there could be some new Charles, you know, some right. new Charles Manson out there uh, who's just saying, "Oh, I can hardly wait for legalization." You know, so I can get my hands on, you know, a lot of mushrooms and get these girls stoned. And yeah, so uh, I think we ought not to pretend that's never going to happen again. Right. There's a lot of people making Kool-Aid that want to move to South America or or maybe get into the minds of people that may need help or promise help. If if knowing what you know now, would you have changed anything in your initial research with the, with that study? If if you had all the knowledge you had today, would you have changed anything? Um, that's a good question. My first answer is I don't think so. <laughs> that's I don't a good think answer. I would. Yeah, uh, you know, we thought a lot about it. Yeah, Terrence McKenna. I um, mean, I spent an afternoon strategizing about the DMT study. You know, so it had his stamp of approval as well. Um, yeah, uh, it was give DMT to people that you know, and you know, have them uh, you know, characterize it psychologically with your help, and uh, describe the you know, biological effects. Yeah, you know, very straightforward. Uh, you know, there was no therapy involved. 
uh, there were no hypotheses other than let's see if we can do this. And if we do, you know, let's uh, see if we can do it safely and generate data. I got a lot of grant money uh, first time around you know, from the National Institutes of Health. You know, they were you know, very interested in this work. It was like the first you know, rigorous psychopharmacology study of uh, um, you know, psychedelics that had uh, you know, crossed their desk. You know, so they were eager to you know, see the study take place. Yeah, it's it, it's fascinating me to think about all the work that has happened and it is going to continue to happen down the line because of the pioneering research that you started there. What speaking of Terence McKenna, what do you think about his stoned ape theory? Uh, it makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can't argue with it. Uh, if you're really stoned and you make sounds, you can see them, right? And you know, then you can manipulate. You know how they look, you know, by the you know, change in what you're saying. Yeah, so maybe you could, uh, you know, somehow get a theory of language development uh, from that phenomenon. What a what an incredible set of brothers to have that much intelligence between them. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, you know, where are the parents feeding those kids, man? Yeah, yeah Peonia, Colorado. It's in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> They they, they, they they brought about two giants. Terrence and Dennis are they're, they're giants, you know, they're they're amazing to me. Yeah. You know, I um in preparation for our event, I put up some some uh stuff out in on shroomery, which is an awesome forum that I like to go to sometimes. And I, I had a few people ask some questions. Is it okay if I ask you some of them? Mm-hmm. This one says, Mr. Strassman, what did you find the single largest <clears throat> obstacle to overcome in your research? The singest, uh, single biggest obstacle uh, um, in the beginning, it was you know the permits. Okay. It was really difficult to get those permits, yeah, but I, you know, but I was persistent. Um, I guess you know within the study itself, the biggest obstacle. This is just off the top of my head. It you know, may have been that I had to accept the volunteers' reports at face value. Um, I couldn't interpret them as their brain on drugs or you know, psychoanalytic impulses and conflicts being played out or some archetype being displayed. I really needed to do a thought experiment that entailed taking at face value what they were saying. It's you know, kind of like Ibn Ezra, in a way, you take the text at face value. Um, it, it isn't anything other than what it's trying to tell you. So once I... Uh, I I, th- I think early on, um, I was skeptical. I mean, the stories were just, or the reports were just incredibly outlandish. Uh, and I couldn't quite accept the fact that the drug I was giving them, that they, you know, were in for a while and then would come back to uh, and describe to me, was, you know, taking them to where they told me it was taking them, this completely independent freestanding universe made of light with these beings that communicated with them and i thought well that's a dream or that's you know their feelings about their third grade school teacher or you know, <laughs> something like that uh yeah or it's like some archetype um right. yeah and uh i was skeptical you know i did you know, try to keep it to myself but i i couldn't uh yeah you know so at a certain point i said okay you know, I'm just going to you know go in there, you know, with them and assume uh, that it, it's real. And if it is real, then where does that belief then lead? Uh, so it was much easier to communicate uh, with you know the subjects once I made the decision to you know be more you know plain meaning. Had you done DMT prior to doing that experiment? Yeah. 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 So my DMT experience, I kind of sneak it in at the very end of that book. I feel a bit guilty yeah. now, but, you know, but, but <laughs> still it's, you know, the contents of the epilogue, uh, a psychologist, I just, you know, kind of you know, disguise myself, uh, you know, laying down and uh, smoke the DMT and this huge, uh, you know, blazing waterfall appeared. Uh, just flaming, flaming colors, this waterfall. And 
uh, so out of you know this uh, flaming waterfall um, emerged like you know, four to six of these beings, about you know three to four feet tall, and uh, they just kept on saying over and over to me, "Now do you see? Now do you see? Now do you see?" Just over and over, and uh, I was pretty blown away and came down. Yeah, and uh, I decided that was going to be uh, you know, what I was going to be studying next. That's amazing because that this this idea of now do you see is a like an Ariadne thread that runs through the prophecy as well as the trips. There's always people like, do you see now? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's uh, yeah. It it was a specific message to me. Uh, uh, I think because of you know, just my curiosity, uh, or you know my innate curio- my innate curiosity. Um, yeah, but at the same time, it's a uh, you know, generic admonition, uh, kind of like you know, do you know what you're seeing? Do you see it? Yeah. Uh, so it's a pretty, it's a pretty handy, uh, you know, meme, I guess. Yeah, it is. It and it kind of lends credence to the idea of. I remember reading. It might have been in the Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss, the McKenna's book, where they talk about in in some indigenous tribes, the shaman would take the hallucinogen or he would take the drug and then diagnose the people. And in some ways, I feel like it's important for the individual, be it a therapist or someone who is administering health, to understand the state in which someone else might find themselves in. Have you found that to be true? Well, it's intuitively true. I mean, it, 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 it makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, scientifically, I don't think there's really been a study yet, you know, comparing, you know, let's say antidepressant efficacy uh, of, you know, of you know, psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy, if the therapist has tripped or not. Um, you know, that study has never been done. You would think, though, you know, that if you're familiar with the territory, you'd be able to help people negotiate it. Uh, so, you know, but that's never been studied. It would be a you know, very easy study to do. Um, but I think, you know, my own, for example, DMT experience, I, I, you know, made it easier to empathize and to understand and uh, accept at least, you know, after a month or two, uh, you know, the nature of the, you know, the, uh, the volunteers experiences. One of the little affirmations I wrote down in your book was research is me search. You know, I never heard that before, but it's a great little limerick. <laughs> Yeah, research is me search. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, the, well. So the first time I ever smoked any cannabis, it uh, was extremely psychedelic. You know, fully psychedelic. There were purple clouds coming out of my speakers, and the floor gave way, and my roommate and I were on a carpet, and we were flying over you know, Claremont, <laughs> California. Yeah, it, it, you know, like a shared hallucination. Yeah, um, I started. Um, I, I began you know, college as a chemistry major. Uh, and I thought to myself, you know, this is chemistry. Like a half yeah. hour ago, everything was just the same. And then I smoked this, whatever. And in a half hour, you, you, you know, there's, you know, purple clouds and a flying carpet. You know, so I was bit. It was like, yeah. okay, uh, you know, what's the chemistry of this? I, <laughs> I'd like to understand. And the states themselves were extremely interesting. You know, so, yeah, it was a case of research as me search. I was um, interested in, you know, uh, you know, pursuing, uh, you, know, uh, you know, both those avenues, uh, the experiences themselves and understanding how they worked. I think that that is a, a shared thread with so many people in the community that psychedelic people or people in general sometimes find it's so liberating to see this world that exists around you all the time, but you're not a part of all the time. And sometimes psychedelics allow you just to peer into it via a window or an open door. And then once you do, you're almost hooked. It's like, look at this beautiful world all around me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, if it goes well. If it goes well, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if it goes bad, then it's, I guess it's the opposite. But uh, Slam the door. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, of course, uh, you know, these are the most interesting uh, you know, drugs in all of medicine. Yeah. 
I'm not sure. I'm not sure that once you open that door, you can you can shut that door again. I sometimes I think in in when reading the accounts in your book or reading some of the the literature on PubMed and stuff, it seems that a lot of the difficult times people have in their trips are things that they need to get over in their life, and it keeps coming up, and it's just a way of manifesting itself. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh... Well, there's all kinds of uh, you know, reasons for uh, you know, bad experience. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, set and setting are key. Huge. Uh, you need to be prepared and you need to make certain that everything ar- around you is you know, supportive and safe. Um, you know, so it can turn out to, yeah. Uh, you know, plus if you do you know, find yourself in a you know, tight corner, you know, there's, uh, you know, there's letting go, can't do that, then ask for help. Uh, if you can't do that, then yeah. a, a kind of a stepwise progression. You know, but uh, the idea that once you've had a big psychedelic experience that you're changed forever, um, I, th- I think that's true. And a lot of our volunteers you know, uh, spoke about uh, feeling um, you know, marked you know, once you know, they went through a big experience with DMT. You know, that it was the benchmark. It was... Uh, a fundamental experience uh, in their lives and you would always be. Yeah. It, it's interesting to me, this, this pattern, you know, if, if at least I've seen it, but this just could be my subjective ideas, but it seems to me a lot of people that have gone through psychedelics and been helped by them, then want to go out and in a way evangelize, like they want to help other people get through things. Have you found that in some of the work that you do? Yeah, yeah, it's a common theme. Actually, it can be messianic, uh, uh, and you know, then it could be kind of crazy. Uh, you know, if you know, if if you become uh, if you become messianic, and you're rebuffed, uh, you just might take more, you know, whatever, you know, more psilocybin, let's say, or you know, more DMT, and uh, become even more messianic, and then start, you know, getting in uh, you know, trouble with you know the authorities uh but yeah you know there's this evangelical you know fervor uh which i think is easy to fall prey to you know i don't think it's a good idea uh i think you should retain healthy skepticism about anything that promises to be a panacea and uh, i think that's how psychedelics are being presented and uh i mean who doesn't want to be behind the panacea you know behind right. You know, something which cures all. It's a messianic era. You know, I gave a talk. When was it? I think it was maybe a couple of months ago. You know, for UCSD, and it was called uh, you know, "Mushroom Messianism," mm-hmm. uh, and it was about the you know fervor of it, like you know Donald Trump ought to take acid. I mean, can you imagine <laughs> Donald Trump taking acid? I, I would not want to be within a mile of that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've never thought about imagining that, but now I kind of can't stop. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so funny. All right. Let me ask you this one here. Do you consider, what, what do you consider your greatest contribution, contribution to the field? Uh, well, I think that I started it again. You know, I jump started it. Um, yeah, I think that was a major contribution. And the study itself was a major contribution. Um, we you know, generated a lot of really cool data, which is still being used actually. Uh, there's a group in Canada, which is called Algernon, looking at you know, DMT for stroke, acute stroke and stroke recovery. And they're you know, building on you know, the data that we generated of uh, you know, sub-psychedelic doses of DMT, which do not raise blood pressure or raise heart rate, but still induce the uh, the neurogenesis and the neuroplasticity, even though there's no subjective effect or no blood pressure effect. You know, so they're developing that uh, you know treatment in the future. On any way, they're uh, just getting off the ground. You know, but the idea uh, is to treat stroke. Uh, you know, so we generated a, a lot of really good data, and uh, I think we also demonstrated you know, how to get a study like this off the ground. Um, it 
it, it was a couple of years of hard work. Uh, I submitted things in September 88, and I got approval just before Thanksgiving of 90. Um, and the first, uh, and you know, the first article that I wrote about the DMT study um, was an article about how I was able to get the study approved. You know, like a menu uh, of you know, like a handbook. Like if you want to do Schedule One studies in humans, in in you know the U.S. under the C Controlled Substances Act, uh, you know, here is how you do it. And it was you know, before. Th you, like I think you know the paper came out you know just a few months after I had actually be, you know begun the study. Uh, I used to uh, you know call that article you know the article I, that I wanted to get out if I were hit by a bus because it would still explain right. to others you know how I uh, got this the study up and running. That's a huge achievement and leaving leaving a pathway for someone else to follow to continue is is a huge way to go speaking of studies um i think i had read somewhere and correct me if i'm wrong but perhaps in the future there's a um a stable or a long form a stable dmt i'm not saying that accurate but a long form dmt study where they continue to administer dmt is that something you're working on yeah, well i've been consulting i'm at imperial college i'm in london uh, well, let me give you some background on it. Oh, um, you know, DMT is unique because it doesn't produce tolerance. Like if you take LSD every day for a few days, you'll become uh, you know, tolerant to the subjective effects. Um, you know, so you know, that was never demonstrated I mean, either in animals or humans in previous studies regarding DMT. You know, so we were thinking, um, you know, maybe, you know, that you really need to uh, you know, space, you know, the doses, you know, uh, ex extremely, extremely uh, you know, closely together. Um, you, well, so we gave a big dose of DMT every half hour, you know, four times over the course of the morning. And, you know, there wasn't any tolerance. Uh, the state was as intense after dose number four as it was after dose number one. Uh, you know, so, you know, that uh, you know, theoretically meant you know, continue to expose you know, somebody to DMT, and you know they would be um, as intoxicated as uh, you know, the blood level uh, would cause. And if you increase you know, the level, or you, or 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 you decrease the level, uh, the the state of intoxication uh, would accordingly vary. Um, so I suggested a continuous infusion of DMT at the end of the DMT book in 2001. Andrew Gallimore is a Brit, lives in Japan, uh, you know, cognitive uh, neuroscientist. Uh, he contacted me a number of years ago um, about that idea, and we you know, put together a, a you know, theoretical paper, uh, which you know, came out, I think, in 2016. Yeah, and the group at Imperial uh, uh, yeah, college uh, you picked up on the idea, and they just uh, you published a poster on the experiment. They gave twelve or you know, fourteen people a you know, continuous infusion over a half hour um, at four different levels. I um, mean, it. I mean, it worked. Uh, you, you were in a you know, DMT state for a half hour. Wow. Um, I spoke with one of the volunteers who described it. Yeah, kind of like ayahuasca, but you know, clearer. Uh, mm -hmm. There, you know, you know, there weren't you know the physical side effects which occur with ayahuasca, you know, which is a combination of you know, two plants. You know, one of which will uh, stop the breakdown of DMT in the gut, but uh, um, also you know can cause you know some nausea, some diarrhea, some vomiting. You know, so it was like a, a you know, clearer DMT experience. Um, you know, so ultimately, well, well, yeah, you know, so ultimately, um, you could prolong the infusion. Uh, it could be an hour, it could be a couple hours. Uh, a number of years ago, when the study was just off the ground, um, I wrote to NASA, and I said, you're going to need to keep astronauts occupied for the three years and three months on the way to Mars. You know, what about just infusing them with, you know, DMT, you know, regularly? <laughs> Of course, I never heard back, but but still, I, I, you know, it's an idea whose you know, time is yet to come. Um, 
I think you could uh, you know, benefit you know, from a prolonged infusion even for just a, a you know, few hours. Uh, you know, number one, you'd be able to characterize the state more carefully. Uh, you would be able to establish uh, uh, you know, clearer channels of communication you know, with the beings, for example. You could examine those you know, morphing you know, figures more carefully. Um, and I think also, uh, if you were doing therapy, you could increase you know, the level of intoxication if you wanted to go there. Um, you could lower it, uh, but still you would be in uh, you know, contact you know, with your therapist and you would be in deciding upon the intensity of effect uh, you know, based on what you're, you're talking about in therapy. Uh, you could stop the infusion and just uh, you know, process uh, you know, what just happened, um, you know, so there would be a lot of flexibility with respect, you know, to a, a unique, you know, psychotherapeutic protocol. Yeah. That reminds me in your first book, DMT, the spirit molecule, you'll talk about how people would go through some of their doses and then they would come out. Some of them would come out and have a really rewarding experience. It would be interesting if, if you could see as a therapist, if you could see what they went through and then you could put them back there and, and then, you know, you could work the therapy that way where, and then if someone had a bad experience, obviously you might not put them right back in there, but something that maybe could add on to the initial, initial research. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm yeah, collaborating with a group at I'm a UCLA that's interested in, you know, the repeated, you know, dosing of DMT like we did in you know, veterans with post-traumatic mm -hmm. stress disorder and they would be doing psychotherapy in between doses. Is, does it have healing effects on the body? Were, were you able to document any sort of that? Like as far as maybe we're not sure of what it does in the brain, but does it have healing effects on the body as far as reparative? Yeah. Yeah. It uh, is, it, it's uh, extremely good for the brain. Uh, if you're, exposing uh, if if you're exposing you know neurons in a test tube to conditions of low oxygen you know which is toxic uh, if you add um, if you add some DMT it reduces the toxicity uh, you know, so, um, so in other words um, it reduces you know the toxicity of you know low oxygen levels in neurons um, it also reduces acute stroke size uh, in experimental stroke in rodents and uh, speeds up recovery after stroke in uh, I'm in rodents um, as well. It uh, stimulates what's called uh, neurogenesis, which is the formation of new nerve cells in the brain from stem cells. And it also increases neuroplasticity, um, which is the complexity of interactions among nerve cells. Um, it has immune function. It has anti-inflammatory effects you know, through the Sigma site, you know, so I think it's kind of a handy dandy all purpose, naturally occurring psychedelic, you know, it's extremely interesting, you know, to realize, you know, that the brain makes you know, DMT and the and the concentrations are quite high, you know, comparable to serotonin, let's say. One more piece of evidence regarding the you know, possibility of DMT being a neurotransmitter. Mm -hmm. uh, and you'd kind of wonder what the responsibility or you know, the role of naturally occurring uh, DMT neurotransmitter system would be. Is you it, could go down some deep rabbit holes there. Yeah. Is it secreted by the pituitary gland? Well, the pineal gland. Pineal uh, gland. Uh, yeah. Like, you know, once upon a time, I was convinced the pineal made DMT and it still may make DMT. We, you know, the jury is still out. I you know, marshaled a lot of circumstantial evidence in the DMT book for, uh, you know, for the, uh, the pineal gland making DMT. Um, it you know, contains the ingredients, it contains the enzymes which convert the ingredients into DMT. Um, and a study <clears throat> in, in uh, you know, 2013 from the University of Michigan, I, I you know, demonstrated um, you know, DMT in the fluid you know, surrounding the pineal gland. You know, but the group which a few years back, 2019, you know, demonstrated the you know, high levels. They couldn't find you know, pineal gland you know, DMT this time around. And they think 
what may have happened is that is in the first study that they snagged some brain tissue as you know they were going in and out of the pineal gland and you know they were measuring you know, dmt in the brain as opposed to the pineal you know but still you know the, you know the pineal contains the ingredients to make dmt it's got the enzymes um you know so it may just make dmt at specific times as opposed to routinely yeah it's it blows my mind to think about and so you have to forgive my knowledge about the way the brain works. However, I'm curious if you have any thoughts on the idea that, you know, it, it appears psilocybin is almost like a neurotransmitter as well. And it adapts to the 5-2-A, I think. And so what, isn't it almost like, and this is where I'm probably going to sound silly, but who cares? Because there's no such thing as a dumb question. This is almost like the mushroom talking to us. If it can, if it can, fire a neuron through the synaptic gap isn't that isn't that the mushroom communicating with us for lack of a better description well i don't think that <laughs> you know uh, the mushroom is speaking to us uh i think you know that the mushroom allows communication okay uh with you know parts of with you know parts of reality that we i, I you know normally aren't aware of you know, so it's a tool in a way. Uh, it's you know, providing access. It's mm. opening a portal. Uh, but I don't think it's you know telling anything to us you know, that already isn't within us in the first place. Yeah, it's. I, I I saw a video. I think there's a really good documentary called Fungi out right now, and I've I've read some research. It seems fascinating to me the way that mycelium moves nutrients around a root structure. And then if you look at the fMRIs of the brain, you can see the way someone who's under a large dose of psilocybin gets the, the enzymes and the information moved around their brain. And, and while there's correlation, probably not causation, it's an interesting correlation. Yeah. Um, it's important to, you know, uh, you know, keep in mind, you know, the significance or, you know, the legitimacy, you know, the validity um, of uh, the, you know, brain scan information, you know, because it you know, simply confirms our subjective experience. Mm. And if it didn't, then you wouldn't be paying attention to those <laughs> brain scan data. It's true. Uh, in other words, if you, you know, feel your, you know, sense of self becoming looser, uh, you're not quite as you know, tightly you know, bound together. If you're remembering things from the past you forgot about, if you're recalling emotions or you're feeling emotions, you know, that you've never felt before, you know, that's your subjective experience as confirmed through the you know, brain imaging uh, you know, data. You know, the default mode, uh, yeah. you know, network, you know, connectivity is reduced within itself. You know, communication from lower brain centers, you know, preside compared to you know, um, information, uh, uh, you know, going you know, downhill, you know, from higher to lower you know, centers with, you know, psilocybin, uh, you know, lower to higher centers uh, is, you know, the direction. Yeah, but we know that, you know, based on our subjective experience. So I think it's just explaining, you know, what we already know. <laughs> Do you think that like when we, when we, when we get the, sensation of synesthesia is that like visual information being processed in like broca's area or hearing information being processed the visual cortex yeah i, I just don't know uh, uh, you know because i haven't really uh you know kept up on the uh, synesthesia literature you know, synesthesia is you know seeing sound uh, it's a intermixing of you know, sensory modalities uh, I think it's you know, it's an effect of the you know, like in the brain, you know, someplace or another. Uh, so yeah. There's you know, cross talk that normally doesn't happen. It's fascinating too, just to just to be able to perceive reality in a way that you normally don't makes you understand what you're truly capable of. It just it's 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 a really liberating thing. Yeah, they're very interesting drugs. There's just no doubt about it. You know, they affect every aspect of our minds. You know, they provide a you know, window. Yeah, uh, into consciousness, into the self, those kinds of things. Nice. I got a, I got a few more questions, and then I'll let you go. I know you're probably pressed for time here, and so uh, let's see. Yeah, let me find one good one for the last part here. 
If you look at this decade in the development of psychedelics, what milestones do you see in the immediate future in both research and in the advances of legal and subcultural arenas? Milestones, you think? Well, we need to understand how psychedelics work. You know, how can one class of drugs do you know, so many things? It's just enormous, the number of things you uh, you read about um, or you hear about that uh, you know, psychedelics help. You know, so I think that they can be panacea-like. And I think that uh, works around the mechanism of the placebo response. You know, the placebo response is a biological response. Uh, it's you know, biological. Uh, you do psychotherapy and the brain changes. Uh, you, you know, tell you know, somebody that they're not going to be feeling pain, just give them you know, salt water and you know, there's anesthesia and it's reversed you know, by opiate uh, you know, blocking drugs. So you know, uh, you know, the placebo response is a real biological thing. There's immune components, there's inflammatory components. So I think that you know, panacea has worked through placebo effects. Uh, and I think the you know, neuroplasticity and the neurogenesis you know, ties into the placebo response, which I think is reflected subjectively in the intensity of the experience, the, the subjective experience. So I think if we can kind if, if we understand the way that you know, psychedelics work, you know, then we can apply them you know, to conditions or to situations in which there's a you know, problem in that specific mechanism. You know, so if the placebo response can be steered in an immune direction using psychedelics, then maybe immune disorders you know, can be treated with uh, you know, psychedelics. Uh, you know, so I think understanding the mechanism, and I think it'll help us understand the placebo response, you know, which is an extremely useful part of medicine. So you know, that's the main uh, you know, research milestone is you know, kind of you know, tying in uh, the placebo effect with you know, psychedelics. What was the other uh, you know, format that he was uh, wondering about or she was wondering about? You know, the research world and... And the, the advances in legal and subcultural arenas. Like... Uh, yeah. Um, well, there needs to be some kind of model for society to incorporate psychedelic drugs. Uh, is it going to, you know, is it only going to be the clinic? Uh, is it going to be spas? Is it going to be just, you know, casual in your backyard uh, with your hot dogs, hamburgers, and your psilocybin? Uh, yeah, I, I think some structures in the plural, you know, need to be worked out, um, you know, depending on the, you know, risk-benefit ratio. If you're going to treat schizophrenia with IV DMT, it has to be in a research unit. If you're going to you know, take a stroll in the woods with the garden society, uh, you know it would be a you know, low dose of psilocybin. Everything would be fine. Uh, you know, so uh, there's going to be a spectrum of use and uh, and accessibility. Dr. Strassman, you've been incredibly kind with your time, and this interview has exceeded my imagination, my intellect, my subjective, and my objective goals. I want to say thank you to from everybody out there. From myself, thank you very much for the work you've pioneered, the work you're doing, and the work you'll probably end up doing. Well, thanks, George. It, it was a fun interview. It was really fun for me as well. And um, that's what we got for today. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Aloha.